Welcome to the 30th episode of Arbiter of Worlds. If you're a returning subscriber, thanks for supporting the channel. If you're new to the channel, hello. Here at Arbiter of Worlds, we study the art and science of running and creating tabletop role-playing games. In this episode, we're going to explore the concept of diegesis in the context of role-playing games. Now, diegesis is a complex term with a number of closely related usages. It arose in literary theory, it was then adopted into cinema theory and game theory. It's a difficult concept to understand, but it's central to understanding tabletop RPGs at a theoretical level. Let's start with the definition. The diegesis of a novel is the imaginary world in which the events of the novel occur. The diegesis of a movie is the imaginary world in which the events of the movie occur. And the diegesis of a game is the imaginary world in which the events of the game occur. Diegetic elements are elements of the imaginary world that the characters in the world themselves experience. Non-diegetic elements are elements in the imaginary world that the reader, moviegoer, or player experiences, but the characters do not. Now, to better understand diegesis, let's examine diegetic versus non-diegetic elements in the context of cinematic soundtracks. So in the movie The Matrix, during the iconic lobby shout a shootout, the audience hears Spy Break by the Propeller Heads. That's the song that goes, blah, 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 blah. Awesome. But Neo, Trinity, and the lobby security who are being slaughtered don't get to enjoy Spy Break. There's not a live DJ or a boombox in the room with them. Spy Break is non-diegetic music. It exists outside the imaginary world of the movie. We, the audience, hear it, but the characters do not. In contrast... In the movie Pulp Fiction, the famous dance scene between Vincent Vega and Mia Wallace features diegetic music because they dance to Chuck Berry's You Never Can Tell on the restaurant floor. Vincent and Mia are hearing the song in the imaginary world of the movie. We, the audience, also hear it, of course. But what makes it diegetic is that the characters hear it. So an element is diegetic if both the audience and characters experience it, while it's non-diegetic if the audience experiences it, but the characters do not. But what happens if the characters and audience experience the same element, but in different ways? That is, what if the audience only experiences an element symbolically? So imagine an audience watching Pulp Fiction with the volume turned off and closed captioning turned on. So when the dance scene begins, a subtitle appears that says, Chuck Berry's You Can Never Tell plays. At that moment, the characters Vincent and Mia are hearing You Never Can Tell, but the audience is merely reading a subtitle telling them that's happening. The audience cannot directly experience the diegetic song, so the movie offers a symbolic representation of the song. Does that make the song diegetic or non-diegetic? Hold that thought. Now let's consider the user interface of video games. In, for example, Resident Evil 4, Players have access to health indicators, ammo indicators, objective markers, other information displayed on the screen. But the UI floats there, like subtitles float on a movie screen. In contrast, in Dead Space, players have access to the same information, but the information is displayed on the character Isaac's suit as part of his holographic heads-up display and so on. So the UI of Dead Space is obviously a diegetic element of the game world. Isaac has access to the same UI information that the player does. But is the UI of Resident Evil 4 diegetic or non-diegetic? I would argue that the UI in Resident Evil is the analogical equivalent to the closed caption soundtrack in Pulp Fiction. In both cases, the participant cannot directly experience the element. In Resident Evil, the player cannot actually get bitten by umbrella zombies when the character does. So the UI offers a symbolic representation of being bitten with a health bar. In closed caption Pulp Fiction, the audience cannot actually hear the music when Vincent and Mia do, so the movie offers a symbolic representation of the music with a subtitle. Yet, most cinema theorists would argue that Pulp Fiction has a diegetic soundtrack, and most video game theorists argue that Resident Evil 4 has a non-diegetic UI. So how can we reconcile this theoretical debate? We're going to introduce a third category, the semi-diegetic element. A semi-diegetic element is an element that the character in the world experiences directly, but which the reader, moviegoer, or player experiences representationally. 
Under this definition, the Resident Evil 4 UI and the Pulp Fiction closed caption soundtrack would both be semi-diegetic. With those definitions in place, we can now begin to theorize about tabletop role-playing games. In a role-playing game, we are, by definition, playing the role of a character in the game world. And so therefore, all of the elements of the game should either be diegetic or semi-diegetic. For instance, if the characters discover a treasure map, and their GM hands the players a copy of the actual treasure map that their characters have found, that's a diegetic treasure map. On the other hand, if the characters discover a treasure map, and the GM says, you have found a treasure map, which indicates there is a chest buried about 18 miles to the northeast near an ancient ruin, then that's a semi-diegetic treasure map. Both diegetic and semi-diegetic elements are essential to a tabletop RPG. In contrast, non-diegetic elements have little to no place in a tabletop RPG. By definition, a non-diegetic element is an element that the characters do not experience. Since in an RPG, the player is in the role of the character, there shouldn't be any such elements. If a player snuck a peek at the GM notes and saw that there was treasure buried 18 miles to the northeast, that would be non-diegetic information. Sometimes an RPG game master might add non-diegetic elements to the experience, such as playing epic trailer music during a fight. Hmm? dun 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 But all the mechanics of the game remain diegetic or semi-diegetic. For instance, the GM shouldn't make additional random encounters because the trailer music is loud. Unless, of course, the epic trailer music is diegetic, such as occurs when a blade dancer casts angelic choir and acts. Now, with this foundation, we can clearly differentiate between a tabletop role-playing game and a story game in terms of diegesis. In a role-playing game, the mechanics are diegetic or semi-diegetic. In a story game, at least some of the mechanics are non-diegetic. Anytime a story game pushes you into the stance of a novel author or movie director with metagame powers to shape the world from outside the world, those are non-diegetic elements. We can also now explain the difference between a traditional tabletop RPG and a Nordic LARP. In a role-playing game, the mechanics are sometimes diegetic, but they're mostly semi-diegetic out of necessity. In a Nordic LARP, the mechanics are as diegetic as possible. In a tabletop RPG, you might pick a lock semi-diegetically with a die roll. In a Nordic LARP, you might pick a lock diegetically by inserting a pick into a lock and unlocking it. We can also understand that when a simulationist talks about noetic appreciation of verisimilitude, the verisimilitude to which he is referencing is diegetic verisimilitude. That is, the game is diegetically or semi-diegetically modeling the reality of the game world. When it comes to semi-diegetic elements, the simulations will prefer the closest possible representation of the in-world experience in general. In addition, we can now critically examine the threefold model through the lens of diegesis. Simulationists insist on playing the game with only diegetic and semi-diegetic mechanics in order to enjoy noetic appreciation. Using non-diegetic mechanics is immersion-breaking and avoided. Gamists tend to be neutral with regard to diegetic, semi-diegetic, and non-diegetic mechanics. They can incorporate one, both, or all three elements if they contribute to a challenging and enjoyable game of whatever genre. Narrativists tend to favor games with non-diegetic mechanics that enable them to shape the game world towards dramatically satisfying outcomes, regardless of whether the characters in the game world have any experience in those mechanics. That's what makes them narrativists. And for this reason, pure narrativism always leads to story game. Next week, we're going to use diegetic analysis to understand the difference between player agency and authorial agency and explain the close coupling between simulationism and the agency theory of fun. Before you go, please be sure to press the like and subscribe buttons, which are semi-diegetic methods of representing how much you enjoy my videos. Then head over to the Kickstarter and sign it to be notified for the launch of Adventure Conqueror King System Imperial Imprint. It's going to go live on October 24th, and you don't want to miss the day one backer bonus reward. Link is in the description. I'll see you next week. 